Hello, everyone. My name is Diana Wall, and I'm the science chair of the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative. It's wonderful to welcome you to today because we've got a wonderful topic that's very interesting to a number of us, soil biodiversity in the city. And before we get started, just a few housekeeping things. Number one is that the questions and answers will be in the Q&A, so you can write your questions there. And I do want to say that the panelists will not answer these directly. We have a moderator who will be asking your questions to the panelists. And if we don't get to all your questions, we apologize. But as I said, it's an interesting topic. The other thing is this webinar will be taped and it goes on YouTube and you will receive notice of when that occurs. And then you can share that with your colleagues and your friends, and we appreciate any input you have. So right now I'd like to introduce Lauren Byrne. Lauren Byrne has been working in urban soil ecology for a number of years. He is an expert in soil ecology in urban systems and in the education. How do you teach students about soil uh, biodiversity and urban systems? And so it's a great pleasure. He's from Roger Williams University in the USA. Lauren, take it away. Thank you, Diana, for those kind words. Um, so I'm just going to provide some introductory context here for the panel discussion. I'll try and be brief. Um, first, I want to emphasize that there is a lot of life in urban soils. Often they're portrayed as degraded and polluted and um, but when you dig down in, uh, as my students are doing here on my campus in the one photo, you can find lots of life. Of course, all the major groups and often very high numbers of these organisms. So what are we talking about when we mean urban? Uh, with Kathy, a panelist today, I've uh, recently written a, a book review chapter or a chapter that is a review of urban soil biodiversity. And in that chapter, we present this framework about social ecological soil systems. What's really important to keep in mind is that social systems, and there's lots of variables that I can't get into here, uh, are strong direct and indirect drivers of the soil system, especially biodiversity patterns. And then on the bottom of this image, the soil system, of course, provides ecosystem services and creates some disservices uh, that feed back into the social system. There's a long history, of course, of pedogenesis and other processes that we need to consider. Um, but this is one way to think about what urban means, the close uh, interaction between the social and the soil systems. Um, also, I want to emphasize that we're thinking about not just cities, and that word is often used as a shorthand for urban systems, but suburbs, exurbs, villages, any sort of residential, industrial, commercial landscape we might consider as urban. Further, uh, in our book chapter, we emphasize that we really need to take a much more uh, a, a spatio-temporal approach to urban soil systems as one of the key dimensions. Right? So on the space axis, on the left, we might think about an individual patch, a person's yard, for example, or one institutional place. And then all of those patches come together to make, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. The patches might just be a small square of a garden. And then the different patches of gardens and lawns come together to make parcels that might be your yard. Many different parcels come together to make neighborhoods. And then of course, large regions that have cities and their sprawling exurbs around them. So those space dimensions are really important to think about what patterns we're looking at. Uh, and then over time, we of course have the distant past that may be a strong influence, sort of those clorped soil formation factors, recent pasts such as human activities that cause pollution or fill material and soils, seasons and management regimes change. And then into the future, we can certainly think about planning. How do we make soils better going forward? So all of these multiple dimensions are really important and we need to consider them all interacting as part of these social soil systems. Um, many urban soils are not unhealthy, as I emphasized at the beginning, such as improved gardens that we put compost in, and that provides a lot of food for these organisms. Um, so we don't want to assume going into urban places that the soil is bad. 
However, of course, there is a lot of problems we need to think about in terms of uh, contaminants, uh, disruption due to digging and building and so on. Um, we can fix those soils, so to speak, to improve their ecosystem services. And there's a lot of work that we have been doing in the past about urban soil restoration that I summarized in a book chapter that's out now, if you're interested in learning more. Finally, uh, as an educator, uh, I work at a primarily undergraduate institution, so I spend most of my time teaching. I'm always thinking about how we can engage students and the broader public in urban soils so we can find these cool little places. There on the left is the bird feeder in my backyard. And for some reason, the earthworms love it under that, all that old uh, bird feed. Uh, that's the highest density of earthworms I find in my yard is under that bird feeder. In the middle, of course, we can lift up garbage cans and other materials and find lots of isopods and other organisms living under them. So those are great places to take our students and say, hey, look at all this life. And then on the right-hand side, there's my compost bin. Those are great places to engage with soil organisms, doing research in all of these, and of course, trying to connect with the public. So for our panel, uh, they've been asked to be brief, about five minutes in which they'll speak to uh, their research and then challenges that they see in studying urban bio soil biodiversity. Um, and then third, how might we apply this scientific knowledge to land use policy, especially given climate change? And I think we'll also hear a little bit about education from some of them. So first, Kathy Slavitz is at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland in the USA. Uh, she'll speak a little bit about uh, some basic soil biodiversity patterns, especially her research in macroinvertebrates and I think some biogeochemical cycling. Jessica Davis is at Lancaster University in the UK. She's going to speak about some ecosystem service issues, including food production. And then Pedro Kraus at the Westerdijk Fungal Biodiversity Institute in the Netherlands will speak to us about some of his citizen science work, um, digging into uh, fungal patterns in urban areas. So with that, I will turn it over to Kathy. Thank you. Um, let me share my screen. Thank you for the invitation. Um, uh, so I'm going to focus in this brief introduction on soil fauna specifically, but as as uh, Lauren mentioned, it's usually a collaborative work with between soil scientists, urban ecologists, even soil, social scientists. And so uh, I've been studying urban soils for over two decades. And the fundamental questions that we ask is, is what most urban ecologists ask. And it's focusing on how different human activities in this case, the soil disturbance, which is illustrated here, as well as soil management, which is also illustrated here, affect uh, the soil ecosystem. But we also are interested in learning whether these effects, um, there are some commonality among cities, regardless of geographical location or climate, some commonalities um, in terms of um, community structure or how the urban soil ecosystem functions. Um, I'm trying to, I cannot, okay. So when we talk about urbanization and by bio, soil biodiversity or any biodiversity, uh, people, the first thing that usually comes to people's mind is that the former urbanization is a leading cause to the latter. And that's certainly true. Uh, species do disappear because urban land uh, use change uh, is, is a major disturbance. So obviously uh, many species will not be able to survive. But the degree of this biodiversity loss has not been really studied um, uh, in great details. And in fact, one of the best data set that I know of is still a very old one from the 1970s, when in Warsaw, Poland, uh, a group of scientists went out and just mapped the entire city uh, and also the surrounding region uh, and looking at how much of the regional fauna is pre present in the cities. So we put together this data set uh, specifically for soil uh, macrofauna, soil arthropods. So here you see a bunch of uh, different taxa from different, from spiders to daddy long legs to millipedes, all kinds of beetles. And so what you see here is the, the percentage of regional fauna remaining in the city varies by taxa. So some are more, just more sensitive than others. 
but also if we add to this uh, other uh, green spaces, so not just urban parks, but the suburbia, uh, these numbers improve tremendously. So what that means is that, as also Lauren mentioned, there's this diversity of, of habitat, which is typical of the urban landscape, which is coupled with the diversity of soil conditions, which is something we don't talk too much about, can actually support a very rich life, high diversity below ground. And so I'm illustrating this with one of our data set uh, for mi micro arthropods. And um, these are community compositions, different communities. And the fact that these two circles do not overlap indicates that communities that uh, of these uh, mites and springtail, these cute little um, arthropods, um, in open habitats, turf grass and, and lawns and so on, are very different from communities that live in hooded area. In terms of global patterns, uh, also talking about species diversity, we conducted a meta-analysis on two groups, uh, isopods and millipedes, which are uh, ecologically similar. They're both large and they're both um, uh, detritivores. And what we found uh, compiling a, a pairwise data set from disturbed and not so disturbed areas is that indeed, for both groups, there is a decrease in species richness, but not abundance. And what that means that function may not necessarily be lost. So here yeah, we do lose species from the regional fauna, certainly, but we can also find species. And I want to illustrate this um, with this example from Austria. And uh, the reason I want to do this, um, not just because it's cool to find a new species in a city. And in this case, uh, this is Stefan's Kirche, St. Stephen Cathedral uh, in Vienna, a major tourist attraction. And if you go there along somewhere in this wall, there is this poster. And this poster informs the visitor that in 1998, there was lots of excavation deep down below this uh, cathedral in the catacomb and they found this tiny less than half a millimeter long species of springtail which proved to be new to science along with some other arthropods and so that's by itself is very interesting but what i find interesting is that uh, somebody found this discovery important or fascinating enough to put this on the wall and inform these hundreds of thousands of people who come by to visit uh, this cathedral in terms of where we can use this, um, I perhaps we will discuss this later. As Lauren mentioned, soil restoration is an important uh, task, especially in shrinking cities such as Baltimore, where we have over 10,000 vacant lots, which um, could be used or reused or converted to beneficial places such as for urban agriculture, recreational places. And in this case, knowledge of soil biodiversity as a component of soil health is important. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. All right, Jess. Thanks, Laura. I'm just uh, sharing my screen. Just find the right one. Great, and, and thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this panel. I wouldn't profess to call myself a, a soil biodiversity expert, but I'm looking forward to learning more as part of this panel. And I'm here to provide a broader view on urban soils and ecosystem services. I'm a plant soil biogeochemical modeler. I'm interested in how we can manage land and soils for food and climate outcomes. And I've worked across a wide range of land uses from natural to agricultural settings, but I've become really interested in urban land recently as, as overlooked places for meeting our food and climate goals. If you're interested in, in getting a, a broader perspective on urban soils and ecosystem services, I, I'd recommend you take a look at a recent review from, from our research group at Lancaster. And there's a few interesting points here relevant to the topic today. The first is that there's a lot of activity in uh, soil biodiversity, urban soil biodiversity research in the field. So 42% of the studies in the um, review that we looked at had measures of, of biological activity, indicating that this is a really 
active research area, but it's also worth considering that this is it, these studies only make up two to three percent of all soil biology studies. So this is really a frontier for discovery and, and advancing our understanding and ability to manage these systems. Another interesting point that came out of the review is, uh, that uh, Kathy and, and Lauren has mentioned as well is that urban places don't have to be bad in terms of biodiversity. They can support as much biodiversity, whether that's microarthropods or microbial diversity as other ecosystems. And there's many studies out there that, that show that. So they don't have to be uh, degraded systems. That's the general literature. Moving on to some uh, specific studies that, that we look at in our group. So we, we have a focus at Lancaster on sealed soils. We're very interested in the soils under pavements, pathways, roads, buildings, as this is really part and parcel of, of urbanization and has a big effect on, on soil functioning. And we've been looking at, in particular at soil carbon. Um, and what we find uh, in our studies is that soil carbon content can be significantly increased or decreased under these seal surfaces, depending on how they've been managed and um, how those surfaces have been installed. So topsoil removal, layer mixing, uh, human additions such as charcoal can increase carbon um, and you know, other disturbances uh, decrease carbon. And it's really hard to tell what you're going to find when you uncover these surfaces because one of the big challenges that we have in the urban environment is this complex history and uncertain history of disturbance that we uh, observe across uh, these ecosystems. So as an example, our work centers in Manchester in the UK, and this is a, a old place. It was founded in first century. It's seen a, a lot of human intervention over that time. We saw rapid development in uh, the turn of the, of the 19th century. With, uh, as a major center of the industrial revolution. And this means there's many layers of human disturbance in these soils and very little information on past management that can help us unpick what's happening in these soils sometimes. So this is an example of a profile that was exposed um, that one of our PhD students, Rasheen O'Raden, um, that submitted today. So congratulations to Rasheen. We're really pleased that she's, uh, she's just submitted and um, so this, this profile, there was an art deco house on top of it that's just been recently demolished. So that's 1930s. Prior to that, I think there may have been a timber yard. Um, but how do you know timber yards get managed in terms of soils? Are there you know, wood chip additions burning on site? What sort of surfaces were installed there? We really just don't know how these soils have been disturbed. And, and prior to that, there was probably cultivation at this site as well. So it's a challenge for trying to understand these soils. In terms of biodiversity, there's been some work in our group that looks at this from how it might uh, affect soil carbon and nutrient cycling. And uh, a recent study from Marlon in our group uh, showed for other soils in the, in the northwest of England that they had 90% less fungi and 80% less, less bacteria in sealed soils compared to nearby unsealed soils and, and uh, lower ratios of fungi to bacteria and gram positive to gram negative bacteria, indicating reduced carbon sequestration um, and uh, recalcitrant material. So, you know, this means bad news for, for soil biodiversity and bad news for, for soil carbon cycling. And so sealing can be a real threat. Moving on to the, the final question that I was asked to talk about in these five minutes, and that's how can we use research in management and policy? I think our research points to uh, a couple of, of outcomes. I've not talked about food provision here today. That's something I'm really interested in as well. And I think urban soils present a really positive opportunity if we're thinking about them and planning them well for food provision, carbon storage and biodiversity. Um, but we really need to think carefully about things like sealing, uh, reducing sealing and excavation of soils and, and thinking about carbon when we open up sealed surfaces because these can be high carbon um, soils. But more broadly, I think the answer to this question is that we need to work together. And that's what we've been doing at Lancaster. We've been working together with our local authorities, uh, landscape architects and master planners to develop a set of guiding principles for planning and construction. We're launching them in the summer soon, so I'd be happy to talk about them at a, a later date. But um, yeah, we're really interested to talk here today about how we could incorporate biodiversity better within these principles as well. So I look forward to discussions. Thank you.
Thank you, Jess. And now finally, Pedro. And um, be sure to put in some Q&A so that we have some things to talk about after Pedro's presentation. Thanks. Well, thank you, Lauren. Um, I'm from the Westerdijk Institute, which is the world's largest living fungal collection in the Netherlands. And you know that the Netherlands is very densely populated and people have very small gardens, if any at all. So we were interested to know which fungal species actually survive in these urban environments. And we launched this uh, citizen science project to uh, uh, um, answer that uh, uh, question. So um, basically we work with Musea in the Netherlands where uh, groups of school children come through and then they pick up a kit which they can take home and then sample soil from their garden and uh, uh, mail the kit to, uh, to us, back to us. And we then isolate all the fungi that we can from these soils and uh, identify them with uh, molecular and uh, morphological uh, techniques. There's also a website where the kids can go and they can track their soil sample, clicking in on the area they live in the Netherlands and, and their uh, own garden. And so they can follow and see what is being isolated from their soils. And this initiative also links to the Arise Biodiversity uh, uh, proposal, which is a very big initiative in the Netherlands to characterize all biodiversity uh, in the country, uh, in the biocloud. Actually, today is an open day at Naturalis, our museum, for the Arise project. And the rest of the soil team are there exhibiting what we do in the citizen science project. So lots of children and students also there uh, looking at this with great excitement. And why the kids are so excited is if we find new species, we uh, subsequently name them after the children. So um, this uh, causes great excitement for the, for the children who collected the, the soils in their gardens, as well as uh, the various schools which they uh, belong to. And uh, we organize a lot of uh, open days when, uh, where we engage with the public and we have these events where we hand over the certificates uh, to the children and to the schools, naming these uh, species after the families or the kids that coll <laughs> collected the samples. And um, uh, obviously we also uh, publish a, a range of uh, different uh, papers from uh, dealing with the novel species of yeast and uh, different groups of fungi that we uh, encounter to try and, and name all, all the, uh, the species. I think that most ecologists working with soil will be familiar with the fact that most of the fun fungi that they isolate is actually a black box, unnamed uh, uh, biodiversity. So we try to uh, uh, deal with this in this range of, of papers. And uh, I must say for us, this has proven to be the biggest challenge. Um, in 2007, we published the second edition of the Compendium of Soil Fungi. This is a book that was largely written in the pre-molecular era. The first edition I think was in uh, 1980. And we now know that there's more than a thousand different genera of fungi that occur in soil. And many of these genera are large and, and can have hundreds of species. So it's a huge challenge to, to uh, isolate them, characterize them and name them and, and add accurate DNA barcodes, which will enable uh, other ecologists to accurately identify the biodiversity that uh, they encounter. So uh, that then is uh, uh, my presentation. Um, I wonder now, I should stop sharing. Where am I? There I go. All right. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you to all the panelists. All right. So now I have the unenviable task of sorting through some questions and uh, sparking some good discussion. So I invite all the panelists to come back on the screen. Let's see. Uh, let's begin with one um, that speaks to the interdisciplinary nature of doing urban soil work. Um, as Kathy mentioned, of course, we have to involve a lot of different types of ecologists, not just soil scientists, but uh, a couple of the presentations in particular focused on kind of the historical and thinking about vacant lots and land use patterns. 
So there's a question that came in about how to improve our knowledge of the past and present social systems like land management. Uh, could the panelists provide any suggestions about how to collect this data, harmonize it, uh, in order to better understand that social dimension affecting the soils? I'm, I'm happy to go first, if you like. Thanks, Jess. Yeah, I didn't point to anyone, but I was thinking of you, <laughs> uh, given what you said about the, the logging history at that or the logging industry history at the site was interesting yeah it's really it's it was a really interesting case and and in that case there were archaeologists at the site which was really helpful so i would say you know working with with others you know soil scientists and archaeologists historians really try and understand the history at these sites and and how they may have been treated is is a very useful approach um, how do we scale that up to, to bigger data is, a, is an interesting question, I think. And yeah, I, I, yeah, the opportunity is there for digital humanities, I think, as well. You know, working with digital humanities to try and understand these past land uses and, and yeah, wonder what sort of sources there might be for how that land may have been managed and, and treated that we could draw on. Kathy, do you have any experiences yeah, with that? So the, uh, I'm, I'm working on vacant lot soils and this is a much, uh, much shorter time scale in terms of time. So we're talking about decades, maybe of more than a hundred years, but the city actually has an incredible record of these lots. And so what was there and when they were demolished. And as it turns out, um, so this, has become actually a data science problem because uh, the city is also working with data scientists figuring out uh, when which of these abandoned homes need to be demolished, which one is more dangerous than the others, and there are a lot of other factors going into. And just keep in mind that in Baltimore, we have about 17,000 vacant how homes, vacant houses, and about 14,000 vacant lots. So when I'm looking at, I'm going out and I'm looking at a lot which used to have a home, I would like to know when the home was demolished so that maybe it tells me something about the soil conditions, how long maybe carbon has been in, accumulating there or where was the home? Was it in the front of the, of the lot or the back? Was there a front yard or backyard? Because those might, reflect different soil conditions. And so in that regard, you, you go to the city and um, the city is willing to provide information about this. So in a shorter time scale, this is a very useful source. Excellent. Yes, it all presents new challenges uh, for those of us who want to become ecologists or biologists or environmental scientists that we really have to get some training or at least think outside the traditional box to, to broaden our perspectives to work with those others. Um, second question here, and, and Pedro, I'll direct it to you first uh, because you might have some data from your studies about this. Uh, question is about um, estimating how much soil compaction plays a role in influencing bi soil biodiversity in the urban environment, perhaps reducing it. Um, so we'll start with that. And then the follow-up question would be about uh, how do we how do we uncompact soils uh, or remedies as the person suggested um, in these areas? So Pedro, did you collect yeah. such data to be able to correlate with the biodiversity patterns of the fungi? Unfortunately, not. Uh, all we know is, um, uh, or the data we do have is how some of these soils change over time, mm. and. Um, we could sample the same uh, lot every year and they, they, they change. So you will find some uh, taxa that may be dominant, but there will be new taxa being introduced. So it's a very dynamic uh, system. And what interests us especially is also how the microbes themselves change. We see that if we have these um, microbes from, because we've got them from over a hundred years, so if you look back in time, they, uh, they grew at different temperature ranges than what they are growing, growing now. So they, have, uh, they seem to be adapting to, to climate change. And we also see that um, you know, uh, these microbes are also uh, building up microbial resistance towards uh, fungicides and uh, uh, um, antimicrobial 
products that are being used in agriculture. So we are very interested in those kind of phenomena because this again links to work we do with, with hospitals where people get fungal infections and uh, some of these common soil fungi are, are again implicated there. So for us, this is a very interesting uh, scenario that our medical team are, are very uh, active in. Very good. Compaction. <laughs> Uh, do the Jasser, Kathy, do you have insights about relationships between compaction and any of the organisms? Well, yeah, I mean, compaction is generally uh, creates unfavorable conditions uh, simply because it, it reduces the, the, the spaces, the pore spaces that uh, a lot of uh, the organisms utilize and live in. And so, you know, the smaller, it's not just the pore spaces, but the distribution of the spore paces, right? So certain organisms need larger or easier to move through the soil, others not so much. I mean, a lot of these organisms are endogenic, so they live in the soil. Some are more live on the soil surface and don't move much around um, um, uh, vertically. But those organisms who are endogenic, endogenic and live inside the soil and need to get through the soil, obviously, uh, in a more compacted soil, it, it takes a lot more energy or more difficult, or there's less oxygen for them, um, or maybe there's less water stored in them. So those create unfavorable conditions, uh, which then may lead to, you know, loss of certain components of the soil fauna. I mean, we, we soil often we, we portray urban soils as compacted soils, but then again, it depends on which um, land uh, use type you're looking at. So some of these remnant forests, for instance, they are obviously less disturbance. And so this is less of a problem than uh, maybe areas that are constantly being trampled over. Um, well, how to mitigate this? I mean, people put new topsoil <laughs> or, or compost or, you know, loosen up the soil uh, by a physical means, but that's another story that creates might create disturbance or moving some uh, foreign material might introduce species that may be not desirable. But anyway, so there, there are ways of, of dealing with soil compaction. And perhaps I could just add in like a, a larger scale effect there as well of, of compaction, um, potentially that, you know, there can be a, um, a contributor to soil erosion in, in these landscapes and an urban soil erosion can be 100 times higher than, than agricultural sites and, and so can be a significant you know, force of um, degradation for, for other sites beyond the compacted area as well. Um, so certainly, uh, you know, something to, that needs addressing. Mm -hmm. Another ecosystem service is, of course, uh, infiltration. And so compacted soil greatly reduce infiltration rates. And um, for instance, in Baltimore, uh, we have very frequently big storms. And so um, these unsealed soils potentially are great um, for at least reducing runoff. But the more compacted the soil is, the less um, you know, efficient it is in, in, in this service or function. Sure. Um, I'll add a little bit um, from what I discovered when I was preparing my, my book chapter on urban soil restoration uh, about compaction. Uh, definitely, there is the physical approach. I think one of them is called scoop and dump, where they just bring in giant uh, uh, trucks that literally pull up the soil and drop it, and that breaks oh. it open. Um, on the biological side, of course, we need the organisms to continue creating aggregates in order to prevent it from getting compacted. Uh, fungi, as Pedro was talking about, of course, do a lot of that. And earthworms have been shown to really, uh, when they can survive, burrow, and of course, do the ecosystem engineering of creating the burrows that reduce the compaction. And one of the main points that I found that was just repeated over and over again in the literature is the importance of organic matter. Uh, organic matter is really essential. So if you find the soil is compacted, degraded, perhaps adding organic matter is what's needed to help uh, get the decompaction process going. 
um, and then restore some of those ecosystem services. So it's definitely possible. Uh, let's see, what might be the next topic here? I think there are a few questions about um, food production, urban agriculture. Um, so Pedro, just a quick question and then we can broaden it. Um, were any of the gardens you looking at um, uh, vegetable or food production? Or is it just ornamental flowers type stuff? Uh, well, this is the thing. You see, there, there is no restriction on the kids as to where they uh, could sample. So they, uh, some of them had larger gardens. Some of them had very minute little gardens. Some had uh, vegetable gardens. And uh, this, uh, we have the data, but it's incredibly diverse, you know, because uh, some people have almost no garden in the Netherlands, whereas others, again, have a sizable patch. So uh, unfortunately, um, we'll still need to analyze that because it influences uh, the kind of fungi you will uh, be isolating. If you're starting to look at um, organic material that gets uh, incorporated into the soil, um, then you will get a higher uh, diversity because there are all these fungal endophytes that occur naturally in the plants that then go into the soil but there won't normally be soil fungi that you will get without the plant material. So the different plant parts have some endophytic fungi that are very specific to them. And uh, in this manner, they will land up in the soil. Um, so that could skew the, the, the data somewhat. And we try to work without the organic matter and just look at the, at the soil itself. Good. Um, so on that, topic of urban agriculture. Do, Jess or Kathy, do you have any insights about the relationship perhaps between soil organisms and urban agriculture? What, what are good practices in urban agriculture to help preserve the soil organisms? Or anything else you have perspectives about? So we yes. know that this is an important yeah. thing. It's super important. Um, almost a, a billion people, I think, practices worldwide some form of urban agriculture close to this number. And so, so again, I showed you <clears throat> these uh, plots. And so the, the one of the uh, main interest of, of, of residents to turn uh, these you know, abandoned areas or their own backyard to something useful is for, for growing some food. And this is especially important in places, although such as we have many in Baltimore, which are essentially food deserts. And so people don't have an easy access to healthy you know, produce, especially. So there's a lot of interest in, in urban gardening and, um, and people do want to know <laughs> what's in their soil they are interested in. Of course, there is the practice of, of, of raised beds. If, we, if, if you don't want to, um, uh, obviously you're not certain what your food um, is, what kind of soil is grown into. Um, and so in raised beds, raised beds essentially are somewhat engineered system when you avoid uh, everything that's underneath as much as possible. And so you bring in um, soil, soil from, from, um, from uh, you know, known sources um, that will be fertile enough so that you can grow your food. Um, I don't think people generally are, as far as I know, very familiar of the importance of soil organisms in what kind of services they produce or, or provide in terms of, of soil fertility. So I think there is a, a big educational challenge there um, because people look at soil organisms in cities in many different ways. And one of them is obviously either soil is dead and so it's you know polluted and bad, nothing lives there or those bugs are creepy crawly and so they may not uh, may not be aware of, of these you know useful functions such as aggregate formation or, or mixing soil organic matter and mineral uh, uh, matter and so uh, I think there is an educational component. And so we also have to be aware that some of the organisms, either in urban gardens or in your own backyard, are considered as pests. And they are pests because they, you know, 
damage your lawn or or they are pests of your of your food resources. So I'm often asked about, you know, um, pill bugs, which are one of the most successful group in my view in urban gardens. And and you showed those those pictures of under underneath the, the trash can. And so they're very, very abundant. They are everywhere. And people ask me, but then tell me, but they are eating my tomatoes, are they really or are they not? And so so I think, um, yeah, so it's a bal balancing act. Uh, we can generally talk about the importance of soil biodiversity and these organisms, uh, the role the organisms play in soil fertility and soil health, but also recognizing that not all of them are equally welcome, uh, especially in urban environments. Mm -hmm. Jess? Yeah, I'd like to come in. Um, yeah, that, no, that's that's really a good point, Cathy. Um, and so we've been recently um, working in, in our uh, local region to try and find um, like a transferable methodology for people to find suitable places to grow in urban environments. So thinking about what kind of data sets we need to decide whether something is a, a viable site. And there's a lot of above ground data, but the soils data we have is almost non-existent um, for these areas. And I think people's first concern is contamination, but it, it would be really interesting to think about, well, what, what do we need to know in terms of soil biodiversity to decide what's a good site where you can grow in the ground? I think sites, you can always do things like raise beds that you, you, know, you are able to grow there, but where you can grow in the ground it's um you know that's a that's a great opportunity and um yeah i was really interested kathy in your talk about you know mentioning uh data sets and that data set and also from 1970s being one of the best data sets we have and i'm just wondering what you know what do we need to do to get these these better data sets in urban areas to to support people in, in deciding whether you know this is a this is a good site to invest in and, and start these projects in. I don't know whether you had any sort of thoughts on on what we need to measure really and how we can get to these bigger data sets. So I think one of the probably one of the most uh, efficient ways to go is what Pedro is doing, which is via citizen science. Mm -hmm. In many cases, especially when it comes to larger things, taking a photo, so some kind of eye naturalist, and I know there are some eye naturalist uh, uh, projects which are already focusing on, on, on solar fauna or different groups. And so often just taking a photo and sort of designing this um, uh, sci citizen science experiment in, in, in such a way that it's useful for scientists as well as for the citizens who are participating and they get something out of it. Um, again, um, in the Netherlands, I know that people are extremely conscious about soils, and there's a lot of research, soil-related research, not just fungi, soil invertebrates, and people value and appreciate. It's not the case everywhere. So I, I, again, I think there is a big, some educational component how to actually reach um, or convey this message that, that these are important and fascinating organisms, which is why I showed you the thing from Vienna, is that people don't realize it and they look at uh, things that crawling in their soil, in their, their, around their homes, and they're afraid that, you know, they damage their, their, their flowers or their homes, and some of them do. We don't want termites in our homes and so on. So um, I think it's um, it it needs to be some kind of a, an educational, big educational effort, and um, to get people on board for these kinds of projects. Great, Kathy. So let me pick up with the education theme there, and we'll circle back to Pedro's project. Um, there were some comments that came in, not as questions, but just uh, appreciation for that project and reaching out to people. Um, one interesting perspective somebody mentioned here is the challenge of reaching diverse groups of people for education. Um, this person points out that in some super metropolises, uh, there are only forests of buildings, right? No trees, maybe no green space, uh, little soil then, 
people living in apartments and they don't have gardens. How might we reach those people? Um, Pedro, do you have any examples of how, just in general, perhaps you've reached people to get them into this project? Uh, well, Lauren, it's a, it's a very interesting question, you know, um, uh, because initially we thought it's not a problem, but eventually it turned out to be a problem because when you design a, a, a project like this, you have a certain um, capacity qua manpower of who's going to do what. And when you start interacting with the public, they want feedback. So uh, suddenly you need personnel for that interaction. So the, the first uh, issue we had was getting the kits to the uh, the, the, the collection kits to the school children and to to do that we use musea so we have fungal exhibits at different musea where if the classes of school children come through they can uh, uh, pick that up uh, a less successful um, uh, approach we had was to directly contact the schools because then the schools want a direct constant uh, feedback and uh, you need to um, uh, constantly with Facebook, et cetera, link to these uh, schools and tell them uh, what is going. So uh, um, having a, a website where they could monitor, uh, uh, we found is a, uh, is a better approach for them to follow what's happening with the soils and having a museum where they could pick the things up so you, you don't have to have that physical interaction is also a better approach so that you can put in your, your uh, capacity to do the, the actual work. So it, it sounds quite silly to say this, but uh, uh, the problem with these citizen science projects, is, it's, it's a lot of time and you need, you need the hands to do the lab work. <laughs> and it's, a, it's a lot of work. Soil is very, very complicated, you know, and, and the diversity is huge. Um, and talking about these urban soils and, and uh, as you were referring to now, it's constantly changing. You know, people bring in um, new soils to even out their lawn and they think now everything's fine. It's not. They just brought in a whole lot of pests and pathogens, depending <laughs> where they've got the soil. And they've got huge problems that they never had before. It, it happened in my case. You should see my lawn, you know. So uh, I've been isolating the, the pathogens from from the soil. I don't know where it came from, but was definitely not a vendor we should use again. So it's a complicated thing, the urban environment. And um, uh, the pathogens, uh, usually they are host specific, so they will damage one plant and not, not the rest, but this is not always the case. So understanding that, managing it, managing the biodiversity to enable you to have a healthy garden in the end is, is quite a, a, a complex matter. And as we are moving now, to the uh, stage where we want to have less fungicides, less herbicides. How do we do that? It's a, it's a whole uh, a new uh, dilemma that we are entering into, which is, which is quite uh, uh, complicated. Soil mm -hmm. without methyl bromide and all those things, uh, it, it becomes a, a very complicated story indeed. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Um, but, so but go ahead, Kathy. Yeah, I just want to mention because you mentioned metropolises, and so um, you know, it's a lot of places now they have rooftop uh, green spaces. They create rooftop gardens or vegetables or, or recreational gardens, and also I think landscape design is probably the the we have to sort of connect to landscape designers, and uh, who can hopefully design landscapes where we can demonstrate some of the things that we're talking about. And so you can look at, um, you know, converting some industrial or some abandoned areas, not just vacant lots. If you think about in New York City, about the, what's it called, the high, 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 what's, what is it what, what is it, the high? High rise? Is it high, high line? line? High line, yeah. The oh, high the high line. line. Oh, sorry, yes. High line. The high so line. Oh, my gosh. I love the high line. It's so uh, yeah, everybody loves it. And so these kinds of landscape, which yeah. when you convert something, you know, very sealed, very industrial back to um, something that's, that's pleasing for the people and these opportunities, give, you know, these uh, 
landscape features give, give opportunities to educate, not just about the above ground, but also the below ground. The other thing I think is what Pedro mentioned, uh, the role of museums, natural history museums. And there are some amazing exhibits in, in Chicago, for instance, when you basically look at the soil from with the eye of the soil organisms, everything is enlarged tremendously. There's also one, I believe, in the American Museum of Natural History. So design those uh, exhibits with, with this in mind. Um, I think it can be a, a, an eye opener and lots of school groups going through this museum. So you don't necessarily have to dig outside, but, but also obviously this is preferable, but you can do a lot of things even indoors. Kathy, I'm picturing along the High Line signs like the one you showed <laughs> to educate people about the organisms that are yeah, below the plants. There you go. Yeah, maybe we'll have to reach out to that group and see if we can get a project going. Uh, so there's a lot uh, that's been opened up here that relates to some of the key questions. So let's see if we can dig in deeper, use the bad soil pun, um, on some of what uh, people have brought up that we've already talked about. Um, uh, planning, Kathy, you just mentioned. Um, somebody uh, wants to know a little bit more about how we might use soil biodiversity studies uh, in the urban areas to help contribute to sustainable urban planning. Uh, for example, they raise uh, the issue of groundwater quality and, and linking this. Um, there's also a question about, uh, oh, no, we'll come back to that one. It's about carbon. Um, yeah, let's just leave it at that. Planning issues. How might we translate the science into practice? I think it's a, it's a good question, isn't it? <laughs> that we need to answer. Complicated one. Yeah, yeah, a complicated one. But, you know, it, it should be a priority. We need to be thinking about soil biodiversity during uh, planning and construction. It's become a big priority in terms of those industries improving that they are going to be net positive whatever that you know however that might uh manifest uh in terms of biodiversity and i haven't seen any examples of that including below ground biodiversity yet and but such a an interesting important thing to be incorporating and yeah i'd, I'd love some answers on that <laughs> <laughs> that i could share with people so I think there is a there is a need to actually to study this. We need to provide more data. As far as I know, uh, there's not a whole lot of actual experimental or, or observational data. So we uh, to to make an argument that this is important, we need more kind these kinds of studies. There are some which shows that you know higher, and it's we're talking about in this case mostly functional diversity. I want to mention that in some cases what species you have might not be as important as what they actually do. And in especially in cities that's okay because in cities like we said we, we lose a lot of the native species maybe and they get replaced by species which do much better in, in you know, human um, uh, environments. And so, but as long as the function is there, um, I think that's okay. So we're, we, we need to talk about a little more about functional diversity or make sure those functions are uh, uh, provided by a, a group of organisms. And so, um, so once we have more data, I think we have a better argument. So I think this, this conversation between landscape designer, maybe soil scientists or soil ecologists and, and, the, and the citizens, right? I mean, after all, uh, what the residents, is, is they, they have certain preferences for certain landscape features or they want certain things in their yard and we have to keep that in mind. So um, there's not a whole lot of studies as far as I know of that actually would, you know, approach this from this practical point of view. You're actually quite right. It's a very interesting point. Uh, two years ago, we got a new building and before they were allowed to build, uh, the nature conservation people came to see if there was a unique bat or a, or a butterfly or, or a lizard or something that, that could prohibit them from building. And as there was not, they could go ahead. But nobody even mentions or thinks about soil biodiversity because it's unseen. 
Nobody looks beneath their feet. They don't know what's there. They don't know if it's important or, or if it's unique or if it should be preserved in some way or what the impact would be of uh, just putting down concrete on that whole area. So it's a, it's a huge challenge and probably our biggest hurdle is the lack of data. And, and perhaps I could just come back and just, you know, I think the first simple step that we need to do in planning the construction is, is stop treating soil as a transferable aggregate that can be moved around and it's still okay and it works. And, you know, you can't preserve a tree by putting it through a wood chipper and spreading it over the rest <laughs> of the landscape. So we can't preserve soil and its function and it, as a habitat by digging it up and scooping and dumping i don't know whether that helps lauren that's something i'll be taking away but yeah it, you know soils are, have functional structure and, and we, you can't just treat them like an aggregate and it's a living thing so i i even urban soils is a living thing and so so stop as you said stop looking at soil but also stop thinking that everything can be engineered so if we have a low soil fertility we just add fertilizer and it's going to be good or we have something we don't want we just add some pesticide and it's fine and so i think you know looking at the soil as this complex living thing is the is the foundation to look at sustainability issues and so um I think we sort of have to change our view, as, as Jessica was saying, to, to, to begin with. Absolutely, a lot of education needed. Um, Jess, about the scoop and dump, I think that's most often used in very extremely compacted situations, just to loosen it up because the soil is almost concrete-like. Just, yeah, wrecked. And as a restoration yeah. method, but you're absolutely right. I love that perspective of, of thinking about soil as uh, having a, a large three-dimensional structure and you can't, like a house, you just can't pick it up and move it because mm. it's going to fall apart. Um, to uh, link planning and the education uh, specifically to policies and the government officials that have a lot of oversight in urban environments. So somebody asked about that and how we might work with politicians to craft policies for improving healthy or uh, and making urban soils more healthy. Does anybody have experiences in that realm? Well, I, we've been, as I mentioned, we've been working with our local authorities. I imagine this, this varies a lot internationally um, as to who has responsibility for urban areas and, and suburban and, um, so in, in England, a lot, a lot of responsibility falls back to, to local authority level in terms of setting planning law um, and, and making development decisions. Um, so we've been working with our local authorities and, and national networks of, of local authorities to think about, well, how could we incorporate soils into, into, into planning regulation? Um, but then there's incorporating it into planning, but then it's how it gets implemented as well. And we've just been learning a lot about, you know, how, how these things flow down the chain of, of different um, people, organizations, remits, and how they can get you know, reinterpreted and, and employed. And yeah, I think it's just a really, it's a, it's a tricky area for, for policy and practice that really does need that cross-sector collaboration. Um, but yeah, I'd be interested to know more about, you know, how this sits in other international um, settings as well, um, whether there's better solutions there. So I, th I because I mentioned, uh, we, we are um, also, um, there's an international collaboration. And through that, I learned just how differently people view landscaping, soils, uh, you know, urban planning, depending on the country, the culture, or even the city you are at. So it, in, uh, in some places, this is a, a it's, it's the green city, I guess, um, is, is so much uh, in the focus of urban planning and in others, you know, much less so for, for different reasons. So in Baltimore, for instance, the, the focus when, if I wanna talk about soil or soil health, soil health really is, 
then I need to connect this right away to human health because that is what people care about, especially with regard to uh, heavy metal pollution, you know, the lead legacy of lead or other heavy metals in the soil. So I guess one way of talking to, to politicians is to find that thread that um, they focus on or they, they listen to. They not all listen to mites and, and, and earthworms and any of those things. So, but the other issue obviously is, is really financial. So our, our city is, is not, doesn't have the resources to sort of deal with it and too, too much to, to collaborate to, you know, to great extent on these kinds of projects. At the same time, I know that in New York City, for instance, there is an urban soil institute and they sort of constantly communicate with city officials, NGOs, urban gardeners, various garden associations and things like that. So it's probably varies from, from place to place. Uh, working with the grassroots organizations already in place to influence the policymakers. So. Uh, well, I, I want to. I want just sorry. I just okay. want to say one thing, uh, and I it came up with earlier in terms of uh, you know um, how something needs to be top down or or bottom up, and in some cases, you know, it depends on the question, but probably in different cases, one is better than the other. But I'm, I'm working a lot with earthworms and I didn't mention this. And so there is this new group of invasive earthworms, Asian earthworms, um, which change soil conditions very differently and, and uh, create undesirable conditions. They reduce compaction for sure, but then uh, increase erosion, their cast, they don't mix the soil, so their cast gets uh, eroded by runoff. And so these, the desire to actually investigate this and questions about controlling it came from gardeners. It was gardeners who first noticed this and they want to learn more about this group of organisms and what they can do to at least reduce their presence or abundances in their garden. So again, it depends on the question, but it can be, can be, can be bottom up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Pedro, I just wanna make sure you have an opportunity on the sort of policy issues. Have you discovered anything through your project? No, not really, uh, but we haven't really been interacting with the legal side at all. Um, mm. So I can't really comment on policy. Okay. Um, so let's see if we can switch back to some basic science sorts of questions. Uh, so we've got some issues of uh, some, some specific organismal type questions and soil carbon as well coming up after that. But this is an interesting question I think about uh, basic research uh, in this context of application, trying to connect it to people's lives and management interests. Um, the question uh, frames it in, say, for example, community gardens. Uh, what would be a good baseline assessment to start with for any uh, organisms, such as uh, number of worms per square foot, number of fungal species, and then over time, um, how long might we expect there to be, uh, or how long would it take for changes to start to happen in some of these organismal groups at the community level or populations? Anybody want to tackle that first? Some of the basics of ecology of abundance and distribution in these pl urban places. So, so I think uh, it might be a good idea to have some biological indicators. So we use, we indeed use a lot of chemical or physical indicators to describe our soils, but rarely biological indicators. Now this is challenging, of course, because it, different groups of organisms get uh, collected different ways and processed different ways. And so we can just talk about everything that lives in the soil. Uh, one um, sort of effort, which is gaining traction. So it needs to be relatively simple obviously for, for people who are not scientists to, to uh, uh, use these, these uh, biological indicators. And one effort that's uh, gaining traction, especially in Europe, is uh, this uh, QBSAR. It's a, essentially uh, an index that people use to assess the number or the 
fu functional groups, I guess, functional groups of microarthropods, those tiny springtails and mice that I talked about. And so it doesn't require taxonomical knowledge, uh, some sampling and some, some um, extraction and counting major morphological type. Um, I mean, earthworms obviously are keystone groups, so, um, and they, change so many things, biological, physical, chemical properties of the soil. So the presence of earthworm is an indication of, of uh, soil functioning. So again, keep in mind that uh, these earthworms may not be native or they, not all groups of earthworms do the same thing. So they are functionally different, but their presence is, is definitely a something that in gardens, we can talk about gardens, is welcome. Uh, Pedro, do you have any insights about sort of baseline fungal numbers and changes well, over time? Yeah, well, uh, the thing is, uh, as a rule of thumb, you know that if you are, uh, if you get a lot of sandy soils to analyze, you get, um, you get uh, not that many species and uh, the diversity goes down. And also if you get dense clay soils, you also get less fungi. We all know what a healthy garden soil looks like and that is the jackpot for us regarding species numbers. Mm -hmm. um, obviously we only focus on the portion of soil biodiversity that we can culture because we want the strains for, for the culture collection and for other research projects. So a large portion of soil biodiversity cannot be grown in culture and uh, remains unseen and will only be encountered based on a, DSA, a DNA signal, you know. But uh, the soil type definitely uh, plays a role in the biodiversity and also then the ecology of, of where uh, it comes from. You know, if you um, have a more uh, um, um, arid or extreme environment, then it also changes again. You know, um, just this weekend, I'll be flying off to the desert to go uh, sample those uh, sandy soils and rocks. I love rocks and rock fungi. And from these rocks, I isolate similar groups of fungi that you will find on the statues in Italy and, and Greece. You know, uh, somehow these extreme environments select for these organisms. Uh, it's, it's the most bizarre thing. And, and those you will find in these hyperliths in the, in the Namib desert, you know, where there's nothing and you pick this rock up and you scrape some of the soil, there will be this fungus. So it's, uh, it's so complicated. We understand so little. Uh, it's, it's really a black box and um, everybody has data and the data is not interlinked. So the data sets are flying past each other like ships in the night. We really need to start uh, start pulling this together to better understand the ecology, which will give us a handle on the diversity that that we encounter linked to the different ecologies. And then from there, what level of diversity is important for certain functions? Yeah, yeah. No, then then it becomes uh, the type of organisms that you need in a healthy soil. What 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 do you need and uh, you know, what species are, are, are needed. And it's like trying to uh, reestablish biodiversity. We all see these uh, traumatic images of all the rainforests gone in Madagascar, in Brazil, etc. And how do you, do you just go there and replant those three species? Would the biodiversity come back? Or do you also need to reestablish the soil biodiversity mm -hmm. that was there when the rainforest was there? You know, just putting the trees there is not the trick. You, you need to get the soil biodiversity back as well. And uh, it's very hard if you didn't know what was there. So it's, uh, um, uh, you know, and in, in Africa, we have these mine heaps of sand and they try to replant it and it doesn't work. And how do you, how do you reestablish biodiversity? It's a very complicated question. And it's not as simple as just planting the tree. You also need to think below ground mm -hmm. and reestablish that component or uh, the tree needs those mycorrhizal fungi to reestablish the whole thing, the whole ecology. It's a very complicated uh, issue indeed.
Yes, uh, not in an urban setting, but I've seen studies of uh, forestry practices when the soil becomes degraded, they actually bring in soils from another forest to reintroduce some of the mycorrhizal fungi. Yeah, But that's yeah. Uh, interesting to think about what you said earlier, Pedro, about bringing in the disease organisms as well. True, true. It's a, it's a nasty trade-off. That is more, I think, uh, a problem in the urban environment mm -hmm. where people with, uh, with little city gardens buy soil. You buy these big bags of containers of soil and you think now my garden's going to be great but these people who, who sell the soils aren't necessarily always as honorable as they should be and they they scavenge these soils from horrendous places and you bring in pests and pathogens you don't want in your garden so <laughs> buying the cheapest soil is not always the best practice yeah. <laughs> uh, here in the states the the bagged soil that you can buy is often shredded uh, wood particle products. Yep. Oof. And I, I actually, I, uh, I use that in one of my classes. I ask students whether this bag soil is really soil or not. Because um, well, when you look I, at what it I, says. The, the best story linked to, to wood chips. Uh, when the Dutch colonized the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa, uh, on the ships they had these uh, citrus trees uh, to, to ensure that the, the sailors had vitamin C. And with it uh, came a pathogen from Europe, Amelaria melia, the, the honey mushroom. And this, the trees were planted in the Compagnie stain in the Cape, and it was surrounded by tall buildings, and there they stayed. But they, we know this from the 1700s because we know how fast the fungus grows. So we could trace it back to the, to the Dutch uh, colonists. <laughs> and um, when the trees died, um, all the gardens are now interlinked and the, tree, the dead trees were chipped. And these chips were then moved to the other side of the mountain where they were spread on all these paths in Kirstenbosch Botanical Garden, which meant that the fungus, a malaria melia, was introduced to the botanical garden on the other side of the mountain, which it was never, uh, it was never there. And from there, it spread right up the mountain and is now killing trees up, uh, up Table Mountain. Mm. And it's been dormant for, for more than 100 or, or 200 years, and, and now it's free. So wood chips are very dangerous uh, because it's, if it's dead trees that you're using, what did it die from? And is the pathogen still in the wood? Mm -hmm. So wood, wood chips are also dangerous in spreading uh, invasive earthworms, as it turns out, because these Asian earthworms that I mentioned, they produce cocoons, you know, earthworms hatch mm -hmm. from tiny cocoons, and they produce large numbers of cocoons, which are tiny, you don't see them. And so because they live in mulch, they're very happy in mulch generally. And so either in nurseries or some other places where people chop up wood and they spread these wood chips, for instance, in trails, in forest trails or places like that. So people can walk much more easily. This is one major way of spreading them into these forests. And so from these forests, the, the, the cocoons hatch and then they start you know, moving into the forest floor and changing everything that's there. So, so moving stuff around soil or, or mulch or these wood chips is, is because we don't see, but we move around with them um, is, indeed, um, is indeed has its risks. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanna to move to soil carbon because there are a few questions about that, but a, a, a question just came in to wrap up this biodiversity organismal part here. Um, and it relates to, I think, Kathy, what you were hinting at about an index, um, that it sounds like a standard methodology for assessments uh, should be developed internationally. Is this reasonable? Is this something that we might be able to achieve or is it uh, too much? So don't bother. Well, I think we need indices. So we do have, you know, we measure soil pH and pH is a standardized way of describing acidity in the soil or we measure soil organic matter. There are uh, these physical and chemical um, um, parameters that we use to characterize the soil, you know, depending on, you know, what considered to be good or bad or, or certain 
or certain uh, concentrations of certain metals or concentrations of, of, of uh, certain nutrients um, that we use to characterize the sword. Now where the thresholds are, that those things are vary by countries probably, or even in small scales, um, but we don't have that uh, for biological uh, component of the soil. So, so I, I agree it would be good to have uh, um, uh, some, some way of indices using some biological indicators. Of course, indicators always um, relate to some standard, which is defined maybe locally. So that in deserts, that will be very different from a tropical rainforest soils or different under different climates. But I think biology is such an important component or life is such an important component of the soil that we need a way to, to characterize the soil and say something about the soil status based upon those characteristics. I don't think we have those things. Any other thoughts about biodiversity indices in the urban environment? Okay. All right, carbon. And, and Jess, I'm gonna turn back to you because a few questions were directed specifically at you. Um, and in context of the sealed soils. Um, so let's see if we can uh, think through some of these complicated relationships. Um, so I'm gonna paraphrase this person's question. So I apologize to them if I don't quite get it right. But um, so you, you show data that under the sealed soils there's less biological activity or at least uh, numbers of organisms, I think was the main slide, right? Mm -hmm. um, suggesting low decomposition of the soil organic matter. Um, that might lead to carbon sequestration in the sense that the carbon's staying there, right? And, but there's no inputs of soil carbon further. So actually reducing mineralization helps preserve that organic matter is the premise. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the quest, I guess the question then, is um, how we reconcile the relationship between microbial activity needed for carbon sequestration and, and this problem of it's reduced. So maybe that's good. Yeah, no, I, I, I really appreciate the, the question and I, and I agree, you know, in terms of, so this lower, lower microbial activity might not be bad news necessarily. When I said uh, bad, I meant for the lower recalcitrance of material there. But um, so the, the permanence of, of the carbon there. Um, but I, I think basically it's kind of complicated and we, we don't have a full picture of this yet. And I think we're going to encounter different dominant processes and mechanisms under different sealed surfaces, depending on a whole bunch of factors. But you could imagine sort of connectivity of the, the subsurface to neighboring regions playing an important role as well. So whether it's hydrologically connected or biologically connected um, may uh, influence whether there's, there's um, microbial activity there or whether there's influx of organic carbon as well into those ecosystems. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I think it's a good a good point um, that was that was raised, and and it's not clear cut really. And and yeah, indeed, there may be trade offs between biodiversity and and retaining carbon in a system where you don't have the inputs from above ground coming in. Mm. So a follow up question related to that, and then if the other panelists want to speak to soil carbon issues, um, if you raise a building or remove the sealed surfaces and expose the soil, does it become a carbon sink or source? Great question. I, I don't think there's going to be one answer, but you can imagine that it could go either way, depending on how that soil is uh, managed, whether you're uh, reintroducing vegetation, that it could mean that it starts to become a sink, or whether it's already, or it could be, it could be a low carbon, uh, soil and you introduce vegetation, you, it becomes a sink, or it could be a high carbon soil. You have, you know, perhaps anthropogenic additions there, like black carbon, that if that soil isn't, the, the cover isn't managed very well, it could be lost from that location. And then uh, what happens to it further through the landscape 
uh, is is uncertain. So I think it could it could go either way. I don't know what the others think. <laughs> yeah, it depends on the degree of disturbance and the kind of management, essentially, in urban systems. So any kind of physical disturbance of an intact, more or less intact soil leads to carbon loss because, you know, like tilling, the, you can think about this as tilling the soil, you are bringing up, you, you're bringing down oxygen, you're bringing uh, uh, up uh, organisms and so you basically expose uh, this buried carbon to to decomposition and essentially CO2 uh, release. On the other hand, as, as Jess was saying, you start planting and maybe planting is important. So certain extent, or, or what you're planting is important. Planting perennials is usually a better way. Planting things which have deep roots is a better way of of moving carbon to deeper layer and not disturbing the soil afterwards. Planting trees obviously um, is, uh, is a way of, of storing more carbon. So what's happening afterwards uh, and whether the soil uh, you know, is disturbed again or, 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 or can develop on its own will determine uh, this sink and source question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Pedro, to link that to you and, and fungi, um, of course, fungi are really important for creating the aggregates that would protect the carbon. Um, how might we help them do that in these freshly unsealed soils, perhaps? Yeah, well, we don't know, but what we are looking at uh, presently is uh, the question of which combination of fungi do you need uh, to get the, the, the best carbon result. Mm -hmm. So over time, if you take a mix of uh, different species, which species uh, do you put together? Let's say you take 100 or 200 different microbes, different fungal and bacterial species that you put in soil, what will be the result uh, when it stabilizes over a year and what will be the effect on carbon. So th this is something we are looking at uh, presently. I still don't have the answer, but it's extremely interesting and relevant mm -hmm. given the problems we have now with carbon and nitrogen, you know, where the microbes uh, could play a very big role, but we don't know which and in which combination. Yeah. So for those of you out in the audience interested in learning more about um, urban soil carbon, there is a growing body of literature that you can get into. And there, there's a lot of carbon in urban soils to take into consideration. It may not be enough to offset what we're emitting, but uh, certainly management to do some more sequestration is good. All right, being cognizant of time, we're going to look towards wrapping up here. I have one more question I want to pose that's kind of interesting, and then we'll spend some time uh, drawing some conclusions. Um, so to go back to uh, food production and linking that with the sealed soils issue, is it possible to grow food in soil that was sealed and then is opened up? Does anyone have any perspectives or examples uh, of that? How to do it perhaps? Well, first you have to test the soil. So you open up, you test it uh, for all kinds of things. <laughs> um, uh, and, and, you know, taps, test not just the top five to 10, 10 centimeters, because um, even though most of the food that we grow, you know, the root system is very shallow, what's happened in greater depths may determine um, how the water infiltrates and, you know, a lot of other things. So, uh, you get somebody to test the soil and then you can take action and see if, if you can grow. And then if not, add amendment or, or manage it in, in such a way. But I would say that a lot of these sealed soils are engineered soils, right? So we build these things so that it can hold a building or because it's a road and so vehicles can go through it. So those are for the most part, not naturally, at least at the surface part, naturally developing soils to begin with. And Jess probably knows that better. So you probably will have to do something. Yeah, yeah, and depends as, you know, whether they're those really engineered disturbed soils and or whether it's, you know, if it's just a, a path or something, it may not be all that disturbed underneath. And so 
testing, investigating it. I don't have much to add to Kathy's great answer on that. I think just taking a look and getting it tested and thinking about the whole routing depth and, and how water might be flowing through that as well. Organic matter would be yeah. my short answer. Yeah. yeah. Just be careful <laughs> of what type <laughs> of organic matter you add, as we've heard. Even things like sewage is often promoted, uh, not, not raw sewage, of course, but uh, composted sewage waste, solid waste, is often touted as a, as a great soil addition. But uh, you have to be careful because it can contain uh, a lot of salts from our diets. Uh, pharmaceutical materials are a growing area of interest for soil pollution research. So yes, testing some of the chemicals is really important. But of course, carbon is gonna be the food for a lot of these organisms. All right, um, so with a few minutes left here, um, do any of the panelists have thoughts about uh, what you're taking away, wrap up conclusions that you'd like to share? Well, I, I can just say that um, since we started this uh, citizen science project in soil, I have been shocked by the biodiversity that we have encountered. I never thought that there will be so much unknown in soil. You know, I thought we knew it, but we don't. We, we haven't even scraped the surface. And then um, listening to the ecologist and uh, realizing how this interacts with uh, nitrogen and carbon, et cetera, uh, it, it's a very complicated and intricate uh, system. And I, I can only applaud the fact that we are starting to, to talk together and interacting more. And I think that this is the only uh, way to go. Jess? Any uh, final thoughts? I can, go, I can go next. Yeah, I'll, I'll take away from, from Pedro and Kathy the, the power of the public, I think, for this issue. And uh, as a possible data source as well, I thought that was really neat sort of uh, approach and yeah great um, great thing I'll be I'll taken away and yeah just th thank you for inviting me and I would be very open to I th think the question about planning um, is a really important one and you know it will it stirred up thoughts for me and how we incorporate soil biodiversity into into planning and I'll be taking that forward. Okay. So I would like people, everybody at home, a very, not, if not a microscope, at least a very strong hand lens and go out to their yards or their parks and take some soil and just look for a while, just wait and look uh, and be amazed uh, of the amazing diversity that's, that's going out there. And then finding out more of these organisms and perhaps appreciating them even more. And then teaching others about what And then, learned. yeah, spreading the word, yeah. Great, thank you, Kathy. That's a good lead into what I wanna end with because uh, there's one more question and I'm sorry that we didn't get to everybody's questions. It was just not enough time. Um, and certainly we're not experts in some of the questions that came in. So uh, I encourage you to get into the literature, dig more. Um, and that is this final question. Uh, what is the best way for a beginner to learn about soil biodiversity and soil organisms? So this person might be a student, um, but everybody can learn more, right? So I'm going to share my screen. I hope I can get away with that. Um, to share with you uh, an amazing resource, if you don't know about it, it actually comes from the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative website, the Global Soil Biodiversity Atlas for free. You can download chapters and there's lots of topics. Um, and somewhere in here, yeah, chapter two has uh, sections about all of these beautiful organisms um, that you can go and learn more about. It's not urban specific, but it's a great place to uh, learn the basics that then you can go and identify the organisms uh, around you. And I put the link for that directly uh, that you can go to in the chat. And if you don't see the chat when you're watching this later, you can just Google what I showed there and, and find it there. So thank you to all the panelists. Uh, very exciting in this new urban time that we're living in. We didn't, I could have started with that, right? More people live in urbanized areas now on earth than in rural areas. So we really have to embrace our urban soils and all that they can do for us and really appreciate the urban soil life. So thanks to the audience and the questions. 
uh, and we hope to see you next time. Uh, watch for the updates in your same uh, news feeds and emails for the next GSBI uh, webinar. Take care, all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.